All right, well, we're, uh, we're going to get started in about one minute. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everyone. So as soon as you're, uh, as soon as you're all set, we're going to get started. I'm going to try to be, uh, I'm going to try to be very cognizant of everyone's time, and I greatly appreciate all of you that took time to come here today on this beautiful, uh, beautiful Friday morning, crisp. I don't. Or is this? So, Nate, can you hear me in the back? All right. Very good. So, again, good morning, everyone. I appreciate you all taking the time to come here on a, on a, on a beautiful, crisp Friday morning in our city. Um, what I try to do the, uh, usually at the end of January each year is just kind of give a recap of, of how the city, uh, how our city, how we did uh, during 2021. I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges we faced, uh, and I will, I'll go through uh, some programs that we have set up for, for next year and some of our goals. Uh, so I, I, first, first I'll say that in, in 2021, it's been a very tough year for all of us, not just in law enforcement, but our citizens and our region and our country as a whole. We're still dealing with COVID-19 and all of the different variants that we have or that we've experienced. We're seeing shortages in, in our profession and the increase in violence that we've seen across the country. So before I go any further, I would ask that you would just join me in a brief moment of silence for the two New York City police officers, Wilbert Mora and Jason Rivera, who both lost their lives to gun violence, responding to a call on January the 21st, and the victim of our first homicide in the city this year, Mr. Brian Fonville, who lost his life this past Tuesday night. So if you just join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. You know, I'm reminded now more than ever that we can't take on and face all these challenges by ourselves. However, together with a focused and determined approach, I do believe that we can, and many individuals that are in this room can make a difference. By being creative, thinking outside the box, working with our partners and strength, strengthening relationships and developing new, developing new allies and key, our key components to turning things around that we're facing. I want to thank a lot of the individuals that are in the room, uh, not only just the media outlets for covering this, so we can share it with our community, but our assistant city manager, now you know what, now I started, I'll never get, I'll miss somebody. But I appreciate uh, all of you that are here, um, Rob Coleman and Hal from the Boys and Girls Club, Dr. Breeland from Achievable Dreams, it's Kerry Cox, who's a huge, huge supporter. And I can't see some of the people uh, that, 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 are, that are here, so I apologize if I miss anyone. Our vice mayor, I saw Dr. Cherry. I'm not sure where she's hiding, but, <laughs> but either she's got to sit up or i got to stand up more. Uh, 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 Dr. Lyons, appreciate all the help that you have given us in being here today. Um, and Ms. Karen Witherspoon. Ms. Witherspoon is the director of our HR division in the city, and uh, this is her last day with us, and she made time to come here, and I, I, that means a lot to me. Uh, I saw Pastor Maxwell, our president of NAACP as well. I appreciate you being here. And there's a really special group. Um, there's some young people. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be in school or out of school, <laughs> but they're here today. Some of our high school uh, young adult police commissioners are here, and that means a lot because I think some of the things that we're going to talk about are, are I need your help with. The city needs your help with. So in just a few moments, I'm going to go through the year-end statistics 
But I wanted to share with you kind of the last 30 days have been a whirlwind here in, in, in January because I really wanted to talk to a lot of different entities and people and get some input, insight, talk about strategies and ideas. So just a couple of meetings that I've had or been able to have conversations with over the last 30 days. I met with Dr. Park and Richard Wright from our Newport News Public Schools. I attended a dinner with Rob and Hal from our Boys and Girls Club and talked about their thoughts and ideas about some of the issues that we're facing in our city going forward. Our Commonwealth Attorney, Mr. Gwynn, Sheriff Gay Morgan, our city manager and assistant city manager. Uh, I've met uh, with a group of CEOs, business leaders, uh, not only from Peninsula now, but, but um, groups that, that want to do some different, different things and different ideas and how they can help. I was able to meet with a group of, of pastors in the Southeast community. And just yesterday, uh, for lunch, I met with members of Black Lives Matter just to have some conversations and to try to be inclusive because I don't believe that we're going to be able to turn things or address some of the challenges that we're facing just by men and women in uniform. I think it's going to take a collaboration, an effort. So we talked about issues about strategies, initiatives, and we talked about gun violence and that all of us play a role in public safety and that all together, overall, our goal is to increase the quality of life of our citizens here in Newport News. So I thank all of those entities for taking time to talk with me, but I really wanted to, to have those conversations before I sat down and uh, presented some things to you. So what my plan is, is to go through uh, the presentation. You'll see some statistics and numbers. You'll see some charts and graphs, goals and, and partnerships. And um, what I look for, what I'm asking for as we move forward. And I saw, I, I, I don't want to, Ms. Ben Thomas, the director of, of Human, uh, Human Services, I, I saw her, and I appreciate her being here, because one of the things that we're doing is um, some of the successes we had this year is, is because Ben and I sat down last year with Mr. Archer and crafted some responses that we do to our community. All right, so let's get started. And before I, before I, I, I talk a lot about numbers and I look at charts and graphs, but I look at them as trends, where are we at? But please know that I and every member of this department, when we meet every Monday and every Thursday, every Monday and every Thursday, and we go through these numbers and, and, we, and we see our spikes, our trends, every one of those numbers represents a neighborhood and a community. It's our city. They're people. So when we talk about homicide numbers, I understand that those are, those are individuals, they're families. And I look at those numbers to kind of see if our strategies and in initiatives are working or if we need to tweak those, but I don't lose sight of what they actually represent. So on this slide, you can see our, our crime um, comparing to uh, 2021 compared to 2020. I, having conversations with chiefs across, across our, our region and, and, the, and the state, uh, and even some out of state, and you've seen, certainly seen news newscasts across the, across the country about crime this year and the spikes that we've seen in violent crime. We put our violent crime together and our, our total property crime. This year, the city had a 2.4% increase in crime. Now, how is that? You can see, I don't, I'm not going to bore you with reading each number, but we're going to hit some of these. We're definitely going to talk about our homicides, and we're going to talk about gun violence, because that's in, those are things that really, really impact. But, but this year, the, the city had a 2.4% increase in violent crime compared to 20, uh, 2020. Now, how does that play out? So here's a snapshot of our crime over the last six years. And each one of those is an incident of crime. So in 2016, we had 6,500 crimes. And as you, as you see, the, the decrease in 2021 is the first time we've had a, an increase over the last three or four years, or really, I guess, the last six years. And we had a difference. Uh, that what that equates to, 2.4%, what does that mean, Chief? It's about 100 more crimes that we had in 2021 compared to 2020. But it's important that we take a snapshot and see where we're at, is although we saw a, a slight increase in 2021, it's still below 1918 and going back through 16. But it does indicate some things we need to work on. The second thing I wanted to take a look at is our shootings. As we talk about gun violence, I wanted to see where we were at. I did the same time frame from 2016 through to 
2021, and we had had, we'd had 70, right around 80, 80 shootings in 2019 and 2020, and we had 93 last year. That follows the trend. It may be a little uh, shorter than the trend that we've seen in other places, but that's what, that's what most police chiefs and departments are talking about right now is an increase in gun violence. So I wanted to take a look at those. We're going to break those down a little bit. Um, of those 93, 30, about a third, have been cleared. Now that's, that's huge. 30% 30% uh, clearance rate. I think it's actually 32. But 30 32% clearance rate for, for for shootings is difficult. Shootings are harder to clear than 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 some homicides because people sometimes don't want to talk. But the technology that we've invested in and the community that's come forward, and when I say community, I mean our citizens and young people that come forward to share information with us, has made a tremendous difference. Our homicides, 2021 compared to 2020, we had an increase of five. Thirty more in, or five more individuals lost their lives this year than last year, and we've kind of been right there around 2018, 2019, 2020. Some differences we had. We're going to I'm going to show you the motives or the breakdown of what uh, we were able to determine the motives of the homicides we had. That there's some anomalies this year for the first year the first year and at least the last six years, and probably going back further. But the majority of our homicides this year occurred in the north end of the city, as opposed to others. The majority of our homicides were in the north end of the city this year. So what, what are our motives? What's caused, what caused our, our shooting? So if we look at those 30, this is a breakdown. And this is important because it helps us strategize. What do we need to focus on? Which direction are we going? Where do we need to put resources at? What interventions do we need, and where do we start those at? We had five homicides that were a result of robbery. Of those, ro of those five robberies, two were over firearms, and three were over what we would call drug-related robberies. Seven homicides this year are linked to domestic violence. Two are to mental illness. Three we know that are gang-related. Eleven, the biggest category we have, 11 are arguments. And of those arguments, just about 60, 70% are individuals who knew each other that the first thing they grab, instead of pushing each other or, or, or throwing hands, is a firearm. And two were re retaliation. Those are, are sort of our breakdowns. When I, when I met with the detectives in our, our, our aggravated assault division, and I asked a little bit about the breakdown of, the, of the, just the shootings, right? Just the shootings. It followed we had five that were gang-related about 15 just over arguments and then domestic type situations. And I, so we only were able to really look at 30 because that's the, one we clear, that's the ones we have cleared and knew a little bit about. So it makes it a little bit more challenging, but our homicides were able to drill down and get, get a better snapshot of where we're at. So I want to just talk a little bit about clearance rates. So our clearance rates are set by the the FBI, they collect data from every law enforcement agency in the country. It's sent to the FBI, and they, they, they put that in a chart and determine what is the average. They set the average based on data that they collect from each department on clearance rates, arrests that are made. It's not, not court conviction rates. There's a lot of things that play into that. Some cases don't go to court for a year, two years, uh, keeping witnesses together, those type things. But, but our, our national, national clearance rate, it's, uh, the FBI puts that together, and the first thing that we have seen, the first time in about three years, that national clearance rate dropped, right? So the national clearance rate last year was like 62.3, 63%. It dropped this year because of the uptick that we've seen in violence across our country. Now, now our national average is right around 50%. That's the national clearance rate. So I want to look. When we're having crimes, are we solving them? We have twofold to try to disrupt that and, and decrease the number of crimes. But when we do have crimes, are we solving them? Are we being responsive? Are we set up and, and structured the way we need to be? So I'm not going to read all of those to you, but I think it's important to look at two. Our homicide clearance rate at 73%. 
That's impressive. And it's not on here because they don't do a clearance rate for shootings. But I will tell you, in 2019, 20, I'm sorry, 2017, our clearance rates for shootings were about 13%. Because we were structured differently then than we are today. So that's one way, by looking at data, it helps us. In 2017, we had seven, seven detectives that focused on every homicide, every, every shooting, every overdose, every death investigation. Seven. That's a lot. That's a lot on them to handle. And that's not even talking about cases prior. So we've restructured ourselves. We now have 10 homicide detectives. We have eight aggravated assault detectives that focus on those shootings. So they came to able to specialize. We've increased our forensics division from four or five to now we're at 10. That's because the city leadership, assistant city managers and city manager and our, our city council, our mayor have supported some things we need to, to do a better job in the way we're structured and it's paid off. So you can see, if I'm not mistaken, that we're ahead of the national average or above the national average in every one of those categories. And some may ask, well, why does that matter? For two things. It matters that we're addressing crime, and it matters to families who suffered loss. It doesn't bring anyone back, but it allows some closure. So those things are important. And I, I, I credit our community, our detectives, the work around the clock, officers, the way they respond, that has led to that. And one of the things, if you talk to Chief Creswell, and I remember talking with Chief Randall before he left, we wanted to structure ourselves that we're responding to every shooting the same way we're responding to a homicide that we're bringing those resources out there that our narcotics detectives, our gang detectives, our aggravated assault and forensics are responding to those shooting calls just like they would a homicide. That makes a difference. So I want to talk a little bit about firearms, um, just kind of giving you the same six-year snapshot. Um, you can see that those, those have pretty steadily increased since 2018. We did see a drop this year. We're about, about let's see, eight, about, about 220 less than, than what we were last year. Some of, the, some of those things that I would attribute that to is some laws changed. Um, some of the shortages that we've experienced this year, it's kind of hit our department a little bit in 2021. Um, so th those, those things have played a, a factor for us. But we did recover 836 firearms this year, and you, saw, you can see where we were the last, the last five or six years. But that's important. Firearms that were taken off the street, firearms that, were, that are illegal firearms, in the hands of people that are doing harm. So we try to focus, we still have our, our ComStat meetings and our Intel meetings every Thursday. We're doing a ComStat and then Intel, ComStat and Intel. Our ComStat meetings are kind of big picture. It's where the precinct captains are gonna come in and talk about what's going on in their neighborhoods or communities. Our Intel meetings are talking about individuals that are disrupting crime in, in or creating crime issues in those neighborhoods and communities. Each year, I ask each precinct to pick one neighborhood that we're going to focus on. So in the North Precinct, we focused on Beachmont. And, and I'll tell you, if I showed you the numbers from 2019, and then you see 2020 and 2021, so they had a 25% they decrease in the Beachmont neighborhood. If I showed you from 2019, it's about a 50% decrease from 2019. They have done amazing work there. Courthouse Green, they used to focus there. They 18 and 19, they drove those numbers down. 19 and 20 and 21, we've been focusing on Beachmont neighborhood, and they, they've just done a phenomenal job. Trisha and Dresden Lane, we had a decrease two years ago, but we did not have a decrease last year. We had an increase of two crimes. But talking to the precinct detective, they feel like there's some more of the work to be done there. And we've got some strategic partners located right there that we're going we're gonna to talk about here in a second. So I'm glad Rob and Hal are here from the Boys and Girls Club. They may not know it yet, but they're going to play some key roles for us this year. And then it's the same thing for, for martial courts. Uh, we, had, we had 21 more crimes in martial courts. That's trending the opposite direction. And when I want to turn that back around, and the city's making a huge investment with, with C&I and in, in our, in our southeast community. Martial court plays a key role there, and we're not, we're not finished there. We need to have a strong presence there and interact with some of the youth and, and situations that are happening in that community. So we're not ready to leave there. So the three neighborhoods uh, that we focused on last year are Tricia, Dresden Lane, Marshall Courts and Beachmont, and you can see the differences in our, in our numbers there. This year, North Precinct is going to shift, and they are going to focus on the Aqueduct Department Complex in, that, in the neighborhoods that surround Aqueduct, but that's going to be our, our focus point. 
Central Precinct, as I just stated, are going to stay focused on Trisha and Dresden Lane, and South Precinct is going to stay on Marshall Courts. Now, when I say that's where we're focusing, J.P. Smith is our new captain over community youth and outreach. So each captain of those precincts are going to focus on that neighborhood, but I'm going to, we're going to put other resources there than just police. Some of the resources that, I, that I'm going to be calling on for assistance this year is then shop with human services. Who in that neighborhood can we use human, human services for to, to address, to help out? So what are some underlying issues? I'm going to partner with Chief Johnson and the fire department. I want them to give us some, some multiplier and manpower things that we can do in these three neighborhoods. Libraries. They're always talking about, Chief, we'd like to get out more, and, and I think this is a great opportunity we can partner with and do some things with libraries and youth. And again, the Boys and Girls Club. Aqueduct has a, a facility there that I think we can do a lot of things with. So I, I, as I talk to Alan Archer a lot about bringing more resources to the table, those are some of the entities that I want to key in. And if we start small in, in an area that we can want to focus on, and we all come together and, and address issues in those locations. So those are the three neighborhoods that we'll be focusing on this year. So this time next year, we'll be, we'll be looking, talking about those three. Our calls for service, you can see kind of the last four years where we've been. Our calls for service dropped. They went from 100 and, about 173,000 to about 160,000. And that second column talks about our complaints. So we don't just look at crime. I want to look at how are our citizens responding to officers? What kind of complaints are we receiving? So you can see it in 1,000, or I should say 160,000 citizen interactions, calls for service, officer marks out on a call, someone asks us to check, 160,000 interactions with citizens. We had 56 complaints. That's traffic stops, that's responding to a domestic call, 56 complaints that are investigated by our Internal Affairs Division. It's good for me to see those complaints from 108, 86, 80, and 56. We track that. Now, if you were to ask me, well, Chief, what's the, what's, the, what's the number one complaint that we get? It's the same that it's been for the last five or six years. It's demeanor. It's demeanor. We get upset and say things or we're frustrated that we say things that we shouldn't say as officers. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. But I like to see that trend decreasing. Now, I asked the question, or we at, talked about this last year, what can we do different? We worked with our, our partners with DCJS, and I asked uh, a couple of our really senior detectives and sergeants and Kelly King in the PIO office here, if they look at things a little differently, and I asked them to create a program, because we're, we're mandated by DCJS to have so many hours on communication. We created a 40-hour class that we do not get credit for. That means that the academy is a whole another week longer because we don't, get, we don't get credit for that. But it's important how we interact with our citizens, how we talk to this. So they put together a class. Each new recruit class goes through it, and we talked about it at in-service for the officers who are already here. I believe that played a huge role in some of the decreases that we've seen, being able to de-escalate, step back, walk away, have someone else step forward, how we talk, how we approach, that our body language. We work with our domestic violence uh, civilians a lot, and, and they teach us that when we cross that threshold, the demeanor we have sets a lot of tone of how that, that interaction is going to go. So these are, these are both positive slides from where I see with our decrease in, in calls for service and then our decrease for complaints that are made. We also want to look at some of the, the and that's where I talk about with Ms. Thomas and some issues that we face, is I look at overdoses in our city. So you have two, two bars there going over the last six years, non-fatal in yellow, and of course the fatal in, in blue. And both those have increased over the last three years. Riverside does a, trem a tremendous job. Our paramedics and responding, do, if it weren't for them, those numbers would be much, much higher. But that tells me that there's a problem. When we're going from 158 two years ago to, or three years ago, I guess, 2019 to, to 261, that's still increasing. All the programs are out there and all the help that there's some issue, whether it is the, the type of drug being used with fentanyl inside, or people are, are turning to those drugs for what may be because of COVID and all the different things that we're facing, the uncertainty and insecurities that people might have. But that concerns me. These are individuals and families, right? These are neighborhoods. And if I had a map up here to show you, I wish it could be just in one location that we could really surround it with resources, but it is spread throughout. 
I also wanted to take a look at our suicides. You see, 2020 and 2021 were both higher years than what we've seen over the last, compared to the last four, the 31 and 29. And those are impactful to our communities and to our citizens. How do we respond to those? What's driving that? What are those factors? We just had a situation I was called last night about one in the morning. An individual wrecked his car. He got out. He took his jacket off and his keys off and jumped to his death to the interstate. He took his own life. Officers responded to that and saw that and processed that. I, I talked to Chief Grinstead this morning. So I want to take a look at those, those things and see we're, we're, what, what, what can we do different? What is it that we're not doing? Or is, is, and it, I'm telling you, it's not just police. We can't just affect that ourselves. We have to We work with um, our partners, Quincy, down at, at Four Oaks, and issues, some of the issues we have with homeless and mental illness. I was very encouraged to see uh, City Council talking about expanding. I was talking with Sheriff Morgan a lot about our, our bed space shortages for people that need services, and I, I saw City Council having some of those discussions. That, that is something that's needed. So last year I, I showed you this slide, and it talked about our goals and initiatives for 2020-21, and the check marks are beside that here's what we did to accomplish those. The first one is the Marcus Alert System. That's, that's uh, remember we talked a lot about uh, changing responses. So when we get calls from mental illness, uh, we put some things in place. We worked with our assistant city manager and former Chief Hudgens, uh, and then put, pushing it out, it finally came to fruition, our CARES program, where we have a paramedic and a clinician that respond to almost 30 calls a month that officers aren't responding to as the first responders on, on mental illness. That's a change. Now, I'd like to see that expand, but that's a change. I, from what I understand, there are only two, two departments in the state right now that have, one is in Newport News and the other one is Northern Virginia, and the state's looking for what model. And DCGS talks to us a lot about how that's playing out. Is that working? What's the benefits? And I can tell you it is a huge benefit. We still respond to those calls, but we kind of take a second step back. We already talked to you about the new training on de-escalation, and I want to thank those that put that program together. And then a focus on human services. So officers, during the day, we have human services with us, whether it's an issue with elderly or a child or whatever the situation might be. But when you get into the late hours, we don't have as many resources. So I, we, Ben and I had met and talked about a program, and we still both had issues with staffing. So what we did is we hired, we hired social workers in our department last year. Then shop trained them, we house them. And I will tell you, on an average, so something with a child or an elderly individual, we went from a two-hour response, and, when, and I don't, when I say two-hour response, I mean we're calling someone after hours, they're getting the information, they're getting up, getting here, and getting, it's about two hours before we got services. We went from two hours to nine minutes. Those two ladies that we have hired are doing an amazing job, and they work an evening shift into the midnight hours, and they're right here with us. That is, ben, that was a great, great idea. Thank you for training them, but that has made a huge impact on what we're doing in our citizens. We'll probably be going back to see about expanding that. But that, 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 that has been a, a tremendous difference for us. The focus on technology, you're going to hear me talk a little bit that, about that in the next slide as well. We've placed a strong emphasis. I think we're one of the leading departments. I'm not comparing us to anywhere else, but this department is focused on technology. On, on a, technology has helped us on, on solving some of the cases that we've been involved with, and it makes it, it's a force multiplier of us to let us work smarter, faster, if you will, is probably the best way to put it. Better presentations to court and to juries and to judges. Giving every officer here a cell phone that they're able to, to send messages back to our real-time crime center that we built this year and for the real-time crime center to send messages back to officers. That we can, we can look at crime as it's occurring or locations where it's occurring and set up different strategies around that. And the last on, on our goals and initiatives is we wanted to, to start back our Young Adult Police Commissioner program heavy and focus on our youth. And by those that are in the room today, those that helped out at the food peninsula or the food, the, uh, food bank here on the peninsula uh, a couple weeks ago, that, that's a tremendous success. Having, having those kids involved, having those youth involved that tell us, 
you know, this is how we see things, Chief. This is how we, we see, and we have those conversations. And the SROs and the principals and guidance counselors, security officers that make those referrals to us, the, the, those youth are our future, and I value them. I want, I want the youth of this city to know that they matter to me. They play a key role. When we talk about addressing challenges in our community, the youth play a key role. We've got to make sure they're at the table. So what are we focusing on next year? Here's our goals. We're down, well, I will tell you, about a month ago, we were down about 50 officers. We had nine set for the class to start in January. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. I don't have some officers where I need to have them. And the youth in this room know what I'm talking about. So Chief Hires came up with a program and Captain Dunbar. And if recruiting is going to be a place where we focus our efforts, then I got to staff it that way. We can't staff it the same way we have since 1985. So we had nine set about a month ago to go to this class in January. Today we have 27 in that class. And that's important. That is increasing our efforts, going out and reaching homegrown talent, areas around us, marketing this department a different way through the social media, uh, through, through, well, <laughs> through social media. I'll leave it at that. But that has made a tremendous difference. So I want to make sure that we get officers in here and our dispatchers. Those are two areas that we're going to focus on this year. So the academy has started. We have 13 that will graduate in March, 27 that are in the academy now. And as soon as we get, I got done pressuring them for this class, we're going to start pressuring them for the class in April. But I'll be able to put, when school starts back in September, staff some things the way I need to staff it. We're going to focus on civilian leadership. I want to make sure that we don't leave that, that area behind. We did a, a women's leadership focus. That's one of the things. We're in the 30-30 uh, to try to bring Lieutenant Ross, or yeah, Lieutenant Ross and, and, and several lieutenants here, and Captain Funiak now. Uh, we put a program together that we want to increase the, the female leadership and females coming into this department. That's important to try to attract them in, in, in different ways. We've done some videos and some, some interviews, but bringing them into this department is important, and I want to see them in leadership roles as well. We're moving that direction. When I got here in, in 2018, there was one, one female lieutenant and one female captain. The captain had retired, and, and the female lieutenant left a couple months after that. Now we have four female lieutenants, and we just promoted a female captain. That's important. Because people, when they look at departments where they want to come to, they look at those things. That's important. Virtual cop, that's something that myself and Mr. Archer have talked about a while. There's, there are some calls for service that I'm not sure really need an officer to respond to. A lot of times we can take them over the phone, but citizens still want to see an officer. So my hope is in March to roll out a, a link, uh, and I talked to some other chiefs that, that already have this program working or a version of it, but we can roll out a link where they can go on and, and log in, like a Zoom and Teams meeting, if you will, kind of things that we've learned from COVID, and they can talk to an officer over, over through technology. And if we're able to take those reports, I keep other officers in communities and neighborhoods where I need them to be and not responding to a, a report call that I really may not need to send an officer there. So we're trying to identify what those calls are, but minor shopliftings or minor larcenies, something happened where the, the, there's, no, there's no true victim. It's more a property crime type thing that we can take that over, and I think that's going to keep our officers in our communities and speed up some other things that we want to focus on. The last bullet here is gun violence. I want to spend a little time here. What are we going to do about gun violence for the police department and things we want to do in our city? Well, the first thing is we talked about our structure in, in homicide and ag assaults, how it has improved our clearance rates, our response times. We're structuring our narcotics division, our special investigation division, our, our gang unit the same way. I need to increase what's there. They're doing phenomenal work. And we're, we're, we're subbing with our, our federal partners, our officers are on the task force. But when these classes graduate, you will see those divisions increase. Because we're going to take a hard line against individuals that are doing harm in this city. And I'm going to ask several entities in this room to help me do that. Additional shot spotter location. Shot spotter, we have one. Uh, I believe we're going to, uh, my hope is to acquire a second that we would deploy probably in the northern part of the city. It's been a tremendous benefit for us, uh, the way it ties into our technology. So that is my hope as we're, we're going through that and having those discussions. I would like to add a, another shot spotter uh, a system and location here. 
Now, direct intervention. This is where the youth can come in to help me and parents. I get a lot of phone calls, and, and several of the officers will get chief, uh, assistant chief, uh, captain, sergeant, lieutenant, my son, my daughter. They saw this on Facebook, and they'll send it to us. We get a lot about it when we have threats against schools. But we get some where individuals are posting things on Facebook, where they're saying things or they're posting them th things that firearms or whatever it might be are making statements towards another individual or some type of entity. Now, our judges and Commonwealth attorney and officers will tell us that we can't make arrests for what's in a picture. It's in a post. But we can certainly investigate it. So going forward, most likely by the start of March, our gang detectives and narcotic detectives will be knocking on doors and trying to, to interrupt some things, some intervention, and in talking to parents and showing those, this is what we've seen. I don't want your son or daughter to be a victim. I don't want your son or daughter to be a suspect. But I need your help. And we're going to document who we talk to. And we'll be sharing that list with juvenile services. And we'll be sharing that list with Dr. Parker and the schools. Something has got to change that and disrupt it. And sometimes when we get involved, it's too late. And I've heard several parents, I, di I didn't know. We're going to try to show you. But I'm asking, I'm asking parents, if you see those things on... Uh, if you hear those things from your children, that you would let us know and let us try to interrupt. It's not just about banking an arrest. What I want to see is no one getting hurt to reduce the gun violence in this community. But it will take communities to do it. So if you see those things, if you hear those things, that you would let us know. Community partnerships and resources, I've named just about every resource that's in this room. But we're also going to be looking at resources that we haven't met yet, that we haven't when we... That CN, CNU is doing a, a, a study, and then they'll be doing a survey. And we're, I think we're going to meet some new entities, some new grassroots organizations that are doing some great things that we may not know about yet. I want to partner with them. We might have access to something that they don't have. Or we might be able to lend something that they do have. I want to create a youth focus group. So all those entities that I... There's a reason some people got invited today. I would like to have a meeting every two weeks, and I know that's hard. I'd like to have a meeting every two weeks with someone from Human Services, the police department, schools, juvenile services, and see that expand and grow. But to start there, that we talk about neighborhoods in our communities. Maybe we don't get into specifics. There's some laws that, that hurt us about sharing information. But maybe we talk about some neighborhoods that we can put resources in. And I know that's hard. I know that's hard. That's a commitment. But if we're going to change things about gun violence, then we've got to make those commitments and put, put the time and effort in to do it. And I will tell you that is our number one priority going into this year, is to reduce shootings and homicides in this city. Now, I'm reminded that we can't be everywhere, and a lot of those homicides happen behind closed doors. People have got into arguments that what I get that. We're going to try. We're going to try. But I, I know that we cannot do it all, just individuals in uniform. It's going to take all of us and all those different entities and expertise that some grassroots organizations may have with mentoring, and leadership, and the churches, and maybe they can provide spaces for us to, to do events. I was talking to Rob and Hal about a, a Valentine dance for, for young people. That matters. Those things are important. So I'm going to ask people to come together that we meet and just have discussions and talk about strategies. I don't want to just talk to death. I want to put some things in place. In those three neighborhoods that we ask, I'm going to be seeing what can the fire department do in that neighborhood? What can the police department do? What, what recommendations do we have? Can I get libraries out there? Remember the old bookmobile type, right? And officers going out and reading to, to kids on a Saturday afternoon. I need to show those communities that we're not just there for a few meetings and then gone. That's my ask. We're going to create, my hope is to create a, a, a tip line for youth. We secure a phone that is passed around through what group? It could be through dispatch. It could be a hotline here. But who do those youth talk to? Our school resource officers. So if those school resource officers have that phone, that hotline, if you will, and when a teenager, they build those relationships in those schools, they can call that number and get a, get a, a response from an SRO that they might have a relationship with already. That's my plan. Now, we don't, how we got it figured out yet? No. Am I going to work with Hal and Rob, the police foundation, the SROs? Yes. 
that I think it's important for the youth to have a direct line to share information with us, whether it is on gang activity, fights, um, disruptions, threats, people bullying someone, whatever it might be, that we can share that information. It's not to put someone, hey, this is what we heard, it's so we can intervene and direct before it becomes something bigger. And I put prayer here because I was at an event at Liberty uh, Church two, uh, last weekend. And there were like seven or eight pastors. Pastor Maxwell, is that about right? About seven or eight pastors. They got up and they prayed for this city and our region. And I believe there's power in that. And when I saw the number of pastors that came uh, to meet uh, earlier this week and talked to me and the assistant chiefs, they want to get involved. And they made it very clear to me, Chief, we're tired about just seeing Dad and talking. What can we do? That's important to me. But I believe this city has a strong faith. Training our Newport News Public Schools on game behavior, what to look for. Signs, clothing, sharing information with them. We're going to push some of those limits about what we're able to share because I want the schools to know what we know, and I need to know things that they know when it comes to issues with violence. Those things we want to, we got to get ahead of. Environmental officers, when I look at those neighborhoods, one of the issues that the studies will show us is that blight, getting cars, junked cars off the street, increasing the lighting, getting shrubs cut back from stop signs. If a neighborhood looks run down, people will take on that ownership, and it sends a message that, well, maybe they don't care about us in this community or this neighborhood. We've got a pilot program going now that we're trying to address that with, with uh, Officer Greyhouse and, and works and utilities and code enforcement. I think it's been successful. It's getting stuff up. I don't want kids standing on a street corner and there's trash a half block away. They wait for the bus to come pick them up. Let's get that picked up. Now, is that hard work? Yes. Does it mean we're, Yes. But is it important? Yes. So environmental officers is some things that we're looking at because I think blight and how a community looks can be very reflective of some of the characteristics and behavior it takes on. I talked to a lot of pastors and Dr. Vreeland about creating safe spaces. I'm not going to go too much into that. We're still trying to put that together. But an area, a place where kids can come and feel safe, that they can just get away from things, distractors in the neighborhood, and whether it's to study, whether we've got adults there that can do mentorships, whether we can have interactions and communication, where they can be around one another, play basketball, whatever. Boys and girls clubs. I'm glad you're here, Rob and Hal. All, those, all the churches that are going to help us, I'm glad, they're, I'm glad they're watching today. Right? The school system. And I'm going to commit resources there. Our youth are worth that. And we're going to have to think outside the box. We're going to have to be creative. And I'm telling you, I don't have all the answers. I need you all that are here to help me. And I'm asking you. I'm asking you. I want to, we talked about, uh, we're going to hit two of these the selected neighborhood initiatives, we've talked about the three, but we also have set aside, set aside, we've also set aside money that we're going to, when we have, when we start to see a spike, that we have overtime dollars that we're able to put immediate resources into those neighborhoods. We set aside things where we set up off duty or overtime for the mall and school, school activities and community days, but we're going to set it up also that when we have a spike in crime, when those captains look at the resources they have, they're answering calls for service, but I got to put a dedicated group to address things in that particular neighborhood, to shut things down. So if we see, start to see a rash of, of robberies or burglaries, and I'm not saying we get, wait till we get seven or eight. You see two or three in a neighborhood in a short amount of time, we need to disrupt some things until the detectives can determine who they are and make an arrest. But we're going to set money aside for that. DCJS is working with us on that. In technology, our real-time crime center, we, talk, we created that last year, uh, our NIBIN system. That's a system that allows us to, to test shell casings and firearms and to link scenes together. Now, that's important. When we send that stuff to the state lab, we may get those back because they're so inundated, we may get those stuff back in six or eight weeks unless we put a rush on it and get some division heads to sign off on it. A NIBIN system that's right around the corner, we're able to link a shooting that may happen in the southeast community, the, the central part of the city, or over in Hampton, or even across the water. We're able to link those together. So now we know that those four are related, and it helps detectives have an angle of interviews and investigations, and it solves crimes. We've had other cities, other departments come down and look at that system and adopt it as well. So we've talked a little bit about what we're going to do and the help that I'm asking for as we move forward. Um, and, I, and I'm telling you, I, I don't have all 
those are just my, our ideas. I want to ask all the entities in this room if you have any to help us. We will partner with you. Boys and Girls Club, teachers, they're more, they're more engaged with the youth than, than we are at times. They're with them six, seven, well, is that right? Young adult police commissioners, right? You guys are interacting with the, the, your, your, right? Tell us what you think we should be doing or programs that you have that we can be a part of. Rob and Howe are always talking about Steve. Come by, yeah, they call it Steve. Come by the, the Boys and Girls Club. We've redone this over here in, in South Morrison. Come look at it. By the time I get there, they've got kids already sneaking in, playing around and stuff. But that's the kind of stuff we need to do. You know, we got to make we got to make an, an effort to be at those events. I don't want us just to forget some of the things that we've been focusing on in the past couple of years, since the death of, of George Floyd, his murder, what happened in Wisconsin and Atlanta. We have not taken our eye off the ball about trying to improve and staying focused on and embracing 21st century policing. So I'm just touching base here quickly things that we're continuing to do that I think has made a difference with our relationship with our community. We still have citizens on a use of force review board of nine members. Five of those are citizens. Some in this room, Ms. Cox, has been to those boards. Five citizens and four officers. That's nine. There's no way we're having a tie unless somebody doesn't vote. But that's important. Body-worn camera, they, see, they, not, they don't see a 30-second snippet that's on Facebook. They see the entire six or seven minutes. They see that and then they make the decisions in policy, out of policy, or it's in policy, but there might be some training that we could do to do better. I spent a lot of time talking to Pastor Maxwell about that program. He helped me come up with the, how to structure that. And that's important. We have citizens on our boards that help promote the leadership of this department, sergeants and lieutenants and captains, and assistant chiefs. Pastor Maxwell, I don't mean to get mad at him then, Pastor Maxwell and Dr. Lyons, Karen Witherspoon, they promoted the last two assistant chiefs we have, Chief Creswell and, and Chief Hires. They both sit on the panel and helped us make those selections. It's important that our citizens have a say on the leadership of this department. It's reflective. Our Citizens Police Academy, not only for adults but youth and our, our, our alumni, Anna Whalen and all the volunteers that come forward and help us, it's important. We have citizens come in and help go through the recruit process when people are interviewed to be an officer here because they understand what we're looking for. We can teach them all the things that we have in our tool belt and policies and procedures, but I'm, I'm looking for what's here. Do you have a heart for people? Our youth forums, our Facebook conversations, I'll leave that alone. Uh, we're going to continue to walk in our communities. A recruit, recruit community week. We don't get any credit for this. This is another reason our academies take so long. About halfway through, the academy staff takes our recruits. We put the laptops away and we leave things behind and we go out into the community and we work with those that are homeless. We're in our elementary schools, our middle schools. We're in our boys and girls clubs. We work with those that, individuals that have drug addiction problems. We work with our churches. Pastor Cheeks is instrumental in helping us establish where we need to be. And I do that because part of that academy, not just stuff that they learn and are dictated to and tests they take, but they need to see and feel what it's like in our community. And our community needs to see that. That plays a role. Our MPO process. We used to structure our MPO process, our master police officers, that they would take, they would have a specialty and then they would take training classes. We changed that last year. There were some bumps in the road, but for the master police officers that we have in this department, I want 25 or 30 hours of community service, that they're interacting with our citizens, with our youth, with some of our more challenging neighborhoods. So when I see officers out playing soccer with kids on a weekend, that's what I'm talking about at the boys and girls, that's, those are the things I'm looking for. That they're in our community, walking in our neighborhoods, interacting with citizens, that's what I'm looking for. That helps us build those relationships to improve those clearance rates, to deter crime, for someone to pick up a phone and call and say, this is something you might want to look at, Chief. We talked about our course on demeanor, we talked about expanding our care program, and I don't want to forget, I don't want to forget the mental health of our officers. That matters to me. Officers respond to things, they see things, some of the most things I wish people never had to see. They do it daily, they go home and sleep, and they come back and do it again the next day, and we expect them to get it right 100% of the time. Their mental health matters to me. So we now have funding set aside that I can have every officer have at least one visit to our department psychologist. And I share with this department, and I share with you today, in December, 
although one assistant chief got mad at me on the, on the day we selected. But we can work late on a Friday. It's all right. We all, we all had a session with a department psychologist. We talked about things we see and how we do in leadership. That's important. All three assistant chiefs and myself, that matters. The things that our SWAT team responds to, our special victims when they deal with elderly and youth, that matters. Healthy officers make better officers on the street that interact with our community, and that's important to me. Now, I'm sorry if I've taken up too much time, but I just wanted to share some things and kind of where we're at this year. We did have a bump in the road. We had a two, two point, almost 2.5% two increase in crime. We didn't see some of the inc larger increases that I've seen in other places, but I do think we've identified some things we can look at to re reduce that. The big priority for me going forward is reducing the gun violence in our city, creating new partnerships, strengthening the ones that we already have, and staffing this department the way we should. So I appreciate, I'm gonna take a few questions. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask my, my newest reporter in the room, my friend Robert, who's from the communications department. Robert's a senior in high school, from Woodside High School. Did I get it right? Let's see if I got the memory. He's gonna be a senior next year at CNU. Is that right? Freshman. Freshman. Senior this year, going to be a freshman at CNU. <laughs> moving, moving him too fast. <laughs> moving him too fast. But uh, I, I, I think it's important that the youth of this city hear me talk directly to them. So, Robert, let me give you the first question if you have one. Okay, so due to the shooting at the high school basketball game in December, Newport Mesa School has changed its policy after school for after school sporting events. For example, the number of fans allowed at each basketball game has been limited. Has the Newport News Police Department devised any plans or strategies to further ensure that the players and fans are safe so Newport News Public Schools can ease these restrictions? That's a good question, Robert. That's a good question. It bothers me that you have to ask that. It bothers me. What we saw at two of our high schools this year bothers me. In fact, I will share with you that we're sending two or three senior members of this department to another a jurisdiction in Northern Virginia to have a conversation about some lessons learned. We learn from each other. I'm very familiar with the, uh, like I said, I met with Dr. Parker and Richard Wright a couple weeks ago. We talked about, they shared with me their plan about some restrictions or so many allowed. And I think that's a good thing that there is a limited number in a gymnasium, right? That it's different than a football game. So some challenges we have right now are with staffing. I'm just being frank with you. Um, so when I talk about we've got 27 new officers, but I'm not going to see them on the street until August. And you and I have talked, and young people in this room know that there's, there's some places that I don't have staff the way I should, the way I want to. So I think I need your help with that. I believe that the youth of this city know a lot of things going on, and I think sometimes they're afraid to, to say because they don't, oh, I don't, want to, I don't want people to think I'm talking to the police or this or that. I want you to call me, text me, shoot me some. If there's a, an issue going on, we can know about it ahead of time. But what are we doing? So, so your question is very valid. Uh, in football season, it's easy. There's one location where there's a football game. I'm able to staff that with resources. Uh, we put uh, just started the last two years putting uh, patrol cars in the parking lot that drive that lot with their lights on. They're very visible. We get the traffic in and out. People have a good time. Myself and Chief Grinstead go just about every one of those games and see people when they come and enter the stadium. Basketball games are a little more challenging because there are so many on different days or even the same day. So if there's three high school basketball games, I become a little strapped with resources if I want to send four or five officers to each game, especially if there's a game, three games in one night. Where do we go? I've got officers who go to some, leaving at halftime and going to another. I would like to see, and I'm not – this is Steve, this is the chief. If there were a game on Monday and a game on Tuesday and a game on Wednesday and I could have a group that I could pick up and put there, that would help me structure-wise because of some of the manpower shortages. But I also think that, that some of our other ent entities can play a role. I think that making sure that we have uh, the number of security that are there, faculty, um, officers that are there, and it doesn't just have to be officers, right? we got a lot of sergeants, lieutenants, and captains, and chiefs in this department that can come to those games. And that's one of the reasons I want us to focus on youth so much, to come to those games. Chief Grinstead called me last night, he, or earlier this week, he went to two basketball games. 
he likes to tell me, you know, he's a Minchville fan. But, but I got an assistant chief at a high school basketball game. That's what I'm talking about. Those are some things that, that would make it easier. If, if there was one game, and I can put – there's another game on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even Saturday. doesn't make, make – but when we have multiple games on one night, it becomes some challenging for us to stretch resources. But could we use our fire department? Could I ask Chief Johnson, can you send me a couple firemen to this basketball game? Those are things we've got to think outside the box. Do we have some parents, some coaches? Are we going to meet – are we going to identify some grassroots organizations that would want to be at those games and help out? So those – so the safety of the youth are, is, is – is 100% concern. We just got to find some different ways to attach that. Now, I would love this department, we're, we're authorized 470 officers. I believe I would like to have a staff at about 500. Not to make more arrests, but to have more community interaction, right? To build more relationships. That I could have officers walking in neighborhoods, that I could be interacting more with our elementary schools. But right now, the way we're staffed and some shortages. Now, we're getting there. We're going to be good in September. That's why it was so, so vital important to get those, get those recruits in January so when they graduate, I'm good to start in September. That's a great question. Do you have anything else? Uh, the next one was, even with the late uh, officer shortage, is there any plans to increase the number of SROs in high schools? You're hitting on some... Hot topics. Let me ask you, do you think that students want more SROs in the schools? I mean, um, so basically, middle schools I've, seen, I've been to have one resource officer, and then Woodside and Heritage also have one High school, um, yes. resource officer. And so, like Booker T Middle School, that's like, what, 300 kids? And then you have Woodside, which is 1,800 kids. So, I I believe students would feel a little more safe because there is a security officer shortage as well. I've, I've talked to the principal at the school about that as well. Um, so basically, I think it would be much safer for students to have at least uh, two resource officers or three resource officers. Wow. Well, you think students would embrace that? I believe they would. I appreciate that, Robert. Because I agree with you. I think having SROs in those schools is vital. I've looked at the arrests that our SROs make. We're not, we're not, we're not following that trend of that, the, the, the conversation of school to prison pipeline. And I understand it. I've talked to Congressman Bobby Scott a lot, and he talks about, you know, we've got to have clear guidelines. I'm not putting officers in school to make sure that you all aren't on your cell phones or talking during math class, right? Not in the hallway. What I'm there is to build relationships and keep you all safe. And we've seen two situations this year. So I, 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 am not, I am not opposed to that. Some of those larger schools, uh, I mean, those are, and I'll tell you, some of our schools are huge, right? They're huge campuses. That's a lot of ground to cover. So I think your point is very well taken. It's certainly something we can look at. I'd ask uh, anyone else, does anyone else have any, any questions? Sorry, one little, yes, sir. To the best of my knowledge, and I could be wrong, and I apologize to the other chiefs in the area if I'm wrong, but this, you're the only chief that's going out and putting all this out uh, of the crime in, in the area. To the best of my knowledge, you're the only one doing it. Why is it important for you to do this? Why are you doing this? And what's the headline here? What's the takeaway on what you've learned? That's a two-part question. So I'm going to go back and make sure I'm not comparing myself or this department to anywhere else. But I will tell you that one of the fundamental things that we talk about is being open and transparent with this community. I want the citizens to know what the challenges are in our city. I want to be open and transparent about that. When things are good, when we're seeing good decreases, you know, and then we see some, some challenges. So for me, for, for Chief Drew and the Newport News Police Department, we sit around and meet with Kelly King and her staff and talk about what are the numbers? What do they look like? Creswell, how, how are we doing? How is our stuff with the community? How are we doing on those cases? Have we cleared those? I think that's important, and I think that helps build a relationship, and I think it builds trust in our community. So to stand here, I would love to be standing here and telling you that we had decreases across the board. Um, that's just not the case this year. We got hit. This is the first year that we got hit with some of the shortages that we've seen around in other departments. Um, but we're trying to find new and creative ways to address that. But for me, uh, that's the reason. 
that I, I, it, I, I, want, I want everyone here. You know, when we're all focused and we all know what the issue is, as we, it's better than, well, I heard this or I think that or we think. The, here it is. So everybody sees it. Everybody gets the same message. Here's the things that we need to work on. Here's the increases we had in our city. Now, I will tell you, I, I need help. This city has to come together and help all of us create ideas. You know, here's the ideas from the police department. When Mr. Archer meets with, 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 with our group and Ben says, this is what we need to, to help citizens, and Jeff says, this is what we can do in this community, all those play a part. But for me, it is just trying to be open and transparent that this community understands some of the challenges, where we're at, and things that I'm asking. What was the second part? The second question is, what's the headline today? What's the takeaway from your presentation? I'm excited. I'm glad that we're done with 2021. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, I think we have, I think sometimes you got to get knocked back a little bit to reevaluate. I, I had all these meetings in January. I was out of the office a lot. I missed some meetings that I should have been at here. But I wanted to talk to all these different entities because I think we have an opportunity now where people are more engaged and are having the same conversation. What are we going to do to improve the quality of life of our city to reduce crime and address gun violence? Our city council is talking about it. Uh, our, our city manager is talking about it. Those young adult police commissioners, our professors are talking about it. Our teachers are talking about it. Different, different uh, division heads are talking about it. I'm excited. I, I think we have a, an opportunity where everyone now, even, even, those are, there's a reason those clearance rates are where they're at. That's because this community is sharing information with us. They're, they're, they're coming forward and, and letting us know these things. When, when Chief Grinstead gets a call from a parent, hey, this is something I'm concerned about, and we move on it like that. that, that, that that's, that's my headline today. I am excited about moving forward. I am glad we're done with 2021. I know there's still issues with COVID. I know there's uncertainty. Uh, you know, what does tomorrow hold? And that creates a whole nervousness but I believe I believe when, when, I'm, when I'm in a church and I see seven or eight pastors getting up and praying for different parts of this region and I see the number of people that came out that tells me people are ready to galvanize that that is my hope and my, my other question is oh you throwing another one in there I got three it's so okay it. no you're good you're good my other question is what can people do to not be victims of crimes like there you you had a board up there, homicides, yeah. and but you know larcenies, yeah. um, robberies. Some of the numbers are kind of large. What can people do to not be a victim of a crime? I think the first thing you can do is is understand that the majority of the crimes there, especially the violent ones, when we talk about shootings and homicides, the majority, the majority are individuals who have some relationship with one another, know each other. When there are signs of early domestic violence, I'm not just talking about the, the suspect or the victim. I'm talking about the neighbor across, across the way or that lives in the upstairs apartment or that sees it in the parking lot, that they make a phone call, that they get involved, that they don't let those things escalate, that, that you, you, you're aware of your surroundings, what's going on, things that you, that you see. If something doesn't feel right, if, if, you, if someone reaches out to you and wants to to, you're, you're selling something on, on, on eBay or, or one of the social media outlets, that you're not meeting someone at 2 in the morning, right? We've got a spot right out here, three parking spots that they, I, they complain to me about all the time. Chief, those are primary spots that we set aside for people to come change, exchange, ex make those payments. What are you doing at 2 and 3 in the morning? My mom used to tell me nothing good happens after 10 and 11 o'clock at night. All the good shows are off. Ain't nothing good going on, <laughs> right? Um, and then I also think that our families have to be involved. Families have to be involved. Um, and some businesses have to take a hard look at what type of business they have. What type is it closing? What time is it, what type is it opening? What, what, are you, what are you attracting there? What are you setting up for? Are places well lit at night or are they, are they, are they are dilapidated? Right? Do you have camera systems? Those ring cameras and technology is huge for us. I can't tell you the times we go and talk to citizens and ask, hey, we had something happen here. Can we look at your camera? Wow, there it is. So I think it's, it's, it's being open and honest, taking a hard look, having good conversations. But I think it's common sense. Where, are our, where, where is our youth going at 2 in the morning? Why am, why am, I, why am I responding to a, a homicide at, at, a, at 12, 1 o'clock at night? If you, 
and let's say, let me, let me say this. If you engage in that type of activity, if you engage, engage in trafficking narcotics or selling narcotics, if you're picking up and fi carrying firearms, wherever you're at, that means whatever situation you're involved in, there's always one firearm present. You got to make smart choices. This stuff about I carry a firearm because I'm afraid, then let me know about it. Th those are things that we've got to stop. Well, the only way I can protect myself is to carry a gun. Well, where are you going? Well, I don't want to be, if I go to this, if I go to this party, if I go to this activity, I might get in a fight. Then don't go. That may not be the best place to go. Th those are things that I think that smart choices, as I'm telling you, people that decide to get in that gang life, in that drug trafficking life, in that gun style life, there's only a few places they end up. And I am tired. There was a mother I've never met from New Jersey. She was supposed to be here today. Her son was killed in this city in 2005. And she says, I just don't want him to be forgotten. So she couldn't make it. But we talked on the phone. And I'm tired of telling parents, family members, that someone's lost their life. Don't wait till something tragic happens. You're not telling on anybody. It's not snitching. It's about getting involved. Those type things matter to me. And officers see those things. Issues with mental illness, if we see those things, then let's talk about them. Let's get help there. I, I may not have the resource, but then I need some help. What can you do? Oh, Steve, I can do A, B, and C. What location do we need to go visit? That's a partner for me. It doesn't just have to be another officer in uniform. It can be, Rob, how? I got this young man. He can't get, he's having trouble getting to the club. What can we do? Well, we can do, we've got, these are two areas. It's sometimes we just don't talk to each other. We just don't share that information. Those type things. But I think it's, I think it's about being smart, making wise choices. And if something doesn't feel right, then it's probably not right. I hope that answered a little bit of your question. And you, you've obviously been in your position for a few years now. Um, and you came in with a lot of energy. And obviously, it, some of that energy is, is still there. You're still out there in front of everybody. Um, I got less hair now. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. It's OK. Um, no, but you know, how do you, especially when you see you know, those numbers on the rise in the last year, and you, you have to tell these stories continuously, how do you keep that energy and that positive attitude that you guys are going to accomplish these goals that you're setting? That's a great question. How about this? Let's just all give up and go home. Let's see what happens. If that's how anybody feels and any of these entities that I've addressed today and any of these businesses or professions are in this uniform, then we don't need to be where we're at. Because all those things we talk about, we got to remember, that's a small population that cause harm in this city. This is a fantastic... You got, you're, you're built, we're building the best ships in the world down south. We're employ, that's the largest employer in the state. You got Cannon and Ferguson here. You got some of the smartest scientists on the globe at Jefferson Lab. And I believe wholeheartedly we got some of the best and most talented youth in this city. So let's just take that energy, right, and change things. People get in these professions. I tell you what, there, you ask any of these officers back here in uniform. You ask Officer Washington back there in the back. You're a school resource officer. Did you join this job to get rich? I can tell you, he did not. I'm just telling you. He joined this job because he has a passion for people. That's why we select the people. Or the teachers that are doing this job, whether it's mask, no mask, COVID, all that stuff, they, they're doing that job because they care about youth of this city. My mom taught third grade for 30 years. Sometimes she still thinks she's teaching it. She calls down here and talks to me like I'm in the third grade. How are you and your little friends doing? She's talking about the assistant chiefs, my little <laughs> friends, right? But that's why, because people that get in these professions, pastors that stand in a pulpit, then and the, all the stuff that she has to see and her, her group deal with, with abuse of children or elderly and stuff like that, those are hard. Those are hard. So the energy I have is I am encouraged by I, what I haven't shared here is the multiple, multiple, multiple success stories. That if you ask any entity, who's come out of the Boys and Girls Club that made it? I always went to a, a, a dinner, and that's all they talked about. Their mission, children first, children first, children first. I believe, 
as long as I've got in this uniform, I believe we can make a difference. So sometimes you've got to bring that energy, so, and it's hard. And I will tell you, I have a lot of friends here. When I meet, when I meet inter interview new officers, I ask them, why do they choose this city? And they say kind of what you, oh, we just see you out there, we see this or we see that. But when I talk to them, I don't, I don't care what their GPA is. It, I'm all good with it, but what I want to know is, do you have a heart for people? And that's what I task that recruit division. Bring me people into this department who care about people. That's who you see advanced. That's who you see in your, your detective divisions. The people know how to talk to each other. But, but that's why. I, because I believe I have seen success story after success story. Because I sit and talk to these youth that come up here and make fun of me and laugh at me and we tease each other. And then 20 of them show up at the food bank. I don't know what the temperature was. Two. <laughs> right? They're freezing. We got icicles on our hands. And they're laughing. They're cutting it up, right? They're, they're messing with, with Sheriff Morgan. We're, we're, we're putting the, taking food that we're going to feed people. And they get it. And there's energy. And you know what? They didn't leave. They stayed there. Yeah, they, they outworked me and Chief Grinstead. But, but when Chief Creswell brings his kids there, that, that, that matters. When the recruit class comes out on a day off and they come there and want to help out, that matters. I'm encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by new officers that walk across that stage. I'm encouraged by officers that get promoted. I'm encouraged by the talent we have in this city and the tremendous resources we have in this city. So that, that's why I bring them there. Now I, I'll, get, I'll get winded here about 1 o'clock, but that's why. That's fine. Any, any, any other questions or anything else that I can, can address? I, I try to be cognizant of your time. I got one, Chief. Um, you had talked about the recruiting and how it was difficult and um, how you have a short, had a shortfall and then you ramped yes, up the academy. Um, but you also mentioned there are certain places where you don't have officers that you need in the city um, and you're going to have it, like you said, by September. Yes, sir. So, are you talking about the school resource officers? I don't have enough officers in the middle schools the way I'd like to have there. I'm supplementing that with others that are able to go by and spot check it or using sergeants and lieutenants. I don't have a consistency there, and I want an SRO in that school to build relationship with those kids. Uh, Officer mm -hmm. Wilson, Officer, I don't know if he's in here. Today's his last day as well. He was the only school resource officer Chibble Dreams ever had since they started. He was up here. Last week, we had the young adult police commissioners in this room, and he announced that he was, you know, he was, he was retiring after 20-plus years. And th they were all crying. He was crying. I understand they had a, a party for him at, at, at a, a, a Chief Old Dreams, whether the high school or the middle school, but they, they, they celebrated him. And that parking lot was full. I need more Officer Wilsons. I need more Officer Washingtons. I've got to have a consistency in those schools. That's what I was talking to Robert about, and maybe even more than just one. But that's what I, I don't want to have to, who can I send there today? I need a relationship built, and I don't have that ability right now. But that's, that's why it is so vital. That's why I'm so impressed and thankful for Captain Dunbar and, and uh, Chief Hires, Stokes and Walksmith and JP that are working. Hey, we're going to get somebody there, Chief. I want to get back to where we're sending an officer at least one day a week to the elementary schools, so we can go have lunch with those kids. That's hazardous right there, I'm telling you. That's hazardous. <laughs> That's hazardous. But it's fun, and it means something. And when they start note, when they look forward to seeing you or sitting down at a, at a cafeteria having lunch with you, right, don't go with Chief Grinstead. I'm just telling you now. You drink, he'll drink a kid's milk in a minute. <laughs> but, that, but, Pete, that, that, that's, that's what I'm looking Those are areas, and I would like to, one of the reasons we're going to this virtual cop process is I want officers to be in those neighborhoods longer. The more time you spend with someone, if Dr. Lyons was up here, when we talk all the time, she talks about communication, 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 and relationships. It's hard, right? When we've got a relationship, it's, it's hard to have conflict. Or at least when you have conflict, you can address it differently and better. So getting to know our community, that's why I would, you know, I know the city man, assistant city manager is sitting right behind you. He's going to say 500. Yes. Now, I, if he gave it to me right now, if he gave it to me right now, I couldn't get them all trained. But I can tell you what, I know 26 elementary schools that I can have some time with, right? That, that's what I'm talking I, I know so, I know a lot of boys and girls clubs that I can spend officers with. When I talk to Vice Mayor Cherry about what can we do better, how do we think outside the box, 
She's concerned about gun violence. We've had those conversations. She wants to know what we're doing. People ask hard questions, and, and I respect that. But those things are important. So th that's, that's when I say that some of the, the kids know. The kids know. I, I want officers that are permanently assigned to those schools, and, and maybe Robert's got a point. Maybe it should be more than one. Another question I had was just on the, uh, on the shootings and the confiscations of illegal handguns. Yes, sir. Shootings are going up, but the confiscations of handguns went down pretty substantially. Yes, sir. Um, do you, are you pushing for that, for the, those seizures to go up? And is that a concern for you that, that you're seeing that going in sure. reverse direction? I am, I am concerned about the number of firearms in our community. I'm concerned about the number of firearms in the hands of people who have no business having them. I'm concerned about the number of firearms for individuals, whether they're in, in criminal activity, gang activity, that they have that because they feel like this or that. And when they get into a confrontation, the first thing they do, instead of walking away, getting into a pushing match, is they grab that firearm and pull a trigger. And oftentimes they don't fire just one round. That's when you get cars getting hit and houses getting hit, kids inside a home, they see something come through the room. There are some, re there are some different laws and things that, that we don't have at our discretion that we used to have. If you ask me, does that make a difference? You know, this is the first year we've seen a, a, a decrease in firearms. I need to take a hard look at that. I think CNU is going to help me with that an uh, analysis to see those things if there is a correlation. But what I'm telling you are there are too many firearms in circulation in people's hands who should not have them. Are you talking about the laws on vehicle equipment? No, not so much. I'm talking about, I will tell you, a lot of, we, re, we used to recover a lot of firearms from traffic stops and vehicles, and when you associate that with marijuana, right, that is no longer a pre predicator to, to searching a vehicle. So some, of those things, so some of those things have changed. I'm not saying people who smoke marijuana are criminals. I'm not saying people who smoke marijuana are violent, because I'll get 20 emails. Chief, it, uh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I am saying is that sometimes when... When people go from place to place, they transport firearms. And when you're allowed to search something and you recover something, then there it is. We're not searching the vehicles like we used to. But what should be concerning is there were still 800 firearms seized. And that's, that's not, Pete, let me tell you, that ain't no buyback program. We ain't paying for those guns coming off the street, right? That's guns that were taken from search warrants individuals that are throwing them in search warrants where we're recovering, individuals that commit a robbery and they have a firearm on them. People are parked at locations, they got one or two, three guns in their car. That's a problem for me. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. I want to thank everybody for being here. I would be remiss if I did not thank the men and women in this department. Sworn and civilian both. You all have some of the hardest jobs. And the reason I try to run this department like a family is because I know what you give up to be here. I know that you, I know that you give up time with your family, that you miss birthdays and anniversaries. There's some wives of officers and some husbands of, wi husbands of officers that they don't talk to me because when I call them, they know their, hu their husband or wife is going to work. But I know what they give up. I know the hours they put in, the times that they stay over when someone's being evaluated at the hospital, coming in on their day off. We're getting ready to, to have a, one of the best events we have, right, our city marathon. But we got to stop that. And that takes more than 25 or 30 officers. That's a, that's a manpower hit. People will come in on their day off and do that so that this citizens and this community can have a great, a great event. They get work midnight shift and get off and go to court two or three hours. They go home and sleep and come back. Some of the things they see Talk to Pastor Maxwell a lot about some of the stuff that officers are exposed to, right? And they still come to work. And people still join this profession. We may not have the same number of applicants, but I'm telling you, we're still getting dedicated people that care about each other. The best investment we will ever make is the investment we make in each other in this city. This is a good city. Those are a smaller number of individuals that are committing those, some of those heinous acts. And I'm telling you, the technology we have, the way the officers respond to crime, the way that these three assistant chiefs push their divisions, our forensics division, aggravated assault and homicide, when you're clearing 70% of your homicide cases, and I'm telling you, there are others ready to go with warrants on, getting ready to be placed on file. 
Don't come to this city and think you can take advantage of people. I'm not going to tolerate that. We may not make an arrest in every case, but damn it, we're going to try. We're going to try. I appreciate you all coming today. Thank you all for what you do. I'm sorry to hold us so long. I hope you all have a safe weekend with this winter snow right around the corner. Thank you all.